during the rehearsal processes um, and I really like a designer to be around you know and to be able to you know sit there with me and, and kind of look at what's evolving and feed in and say well why, uh, you know why don't we why don't we put the table in the middle today or whatever you know or feed in you know so it's it's definitely a kind of evolving collaborating process you know that we it's not as though it's the designs there at the beginning of the rehearsal process and it, and it doesn't change, although there are some constraints on that, depending on 
in a way you're doing it. I don't know, maybe you might want to talk about your experience of that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it changes. I mean, if you work on, if, if the work is devised, um, and I work on devised pieces as well, I mean, it's constantly changing in the rehearsal room, and sometimes you just have to be thinking on your feet and making huge changes um, as, as it progresses. But sometimes, uh, or at least one of the ways that I try to work with is to provide kind of um, an envelope, kind of like a package which the play can exist in, in multiple kind of permutations. Um, but there have been times, I mean, from, interestingly, uh, Anatomy of a Suicide, um, at the end of the second week of rehearsals, and this is at the Royal Courts where you only get four weeks anyway, uh, at the end of the second week we went, oh, actually, well, all of these flowing pieces that I've designed which differentiate these three spaces that we had on stage, um, it doesn't really work. It's not working with the way that we've found we have to stage this play. So we kind of threw all that out. I, I redesigned that back wall in about um, two and a half hours. Um, and then we kind of like adapted. Thankfully, we're at a stage where the set was only partially constructed. Um, we managed to kind of like save some money by not building some very expensive perspex pieces and uh, basically make something else. But I think... Um, I worked a lot with Vicky Mortimer when I was younger and she said the design is only half finished when you do, when you finish the model and you hand that into the workshop. That's only half the job, the rest of it is still to go. Arnold, before Pamela, just to say. Uh, no, I, in this case I will prefer to be our practitioner. Oh, <laughs> Pamela. Yes. Pamela before Arnold. Yes, Pamela, this is the first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll just... I'd um, like to pick up on two points that maybe relate to your question. Um, um, I First of all, just to say that um, I'm obviously the senior citizen here, isn't you? And so I, um, I had the opportunity, um, who referred to the Brecht uh, coming on? Oh, you, sorry. Um, and I had the opportunity then to meet with Helena Weigel, that was Brett's widow, and to install in the Old Vic um, an exhibition that they brought of the work by Carl von Appen. But in that time, and I was very, very young, um, Helena Weigel <coughs> kind of took to me in a very nice way and taught me lots of things. And one of the things that she said, which is not a word we've mentioned here, but relates perhaps to you, is the importance of the history of the object. So that an object isn't just a thing you put in the space, but it has, if it's a chair, or if it's a jug, or a sunflower, or whatever it is, you read the audience can read the history of the object. And she, um, I, I never forget, um, a wonderful three hours when she should have been rehearsing Bologna in Coriolanus. And she took the jacket of Mother Courage that Caspanea himself had dyed and explained how many times they had washed it and they had grated it with a cheese grater, and they had thrown food at it and washed it again to give the living history, which I think is the fundamental part of the reality that you talk about. So that's just one thing. I don't know if that answers your question, but I wanted to say it anyway. <laughs> Can I just say one more thing? Yes, yes. And then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> um, I, I think that, um, the, I, if I may say so with respect to everyone in this room, I honestly think the word set is absolutely outmoded. And I think that um, we should be reading what I would would call, it's not original to me, the iconography 
of the space, as you might read the iconography of a screen in a cathedral and know the story of it. So those are two words I'd just like to throw into the debate, history and iconography. Thank you. We move, but I mean, that sort of answers some of your questions. More questions? I'm sure there are. Uh, this lady here, then Peter, yes. Um, I have a question for Alex about how the design might change the genre of the frame, because I was really struck by your realist designs for not necessarily realist plays like Beckett and Sarah Kane, whereas Anatomy and Suicide um, I think is a far more realist play, but you wouldn't consider that a realist design. So could you talk a bit more about about how that might relate to the genre of the play and why you don't consider the design of Anatomy to be realist? Um, the, uh, well, if, if I explain uh, very quickly then, the design for Anatomy was, um, well, an, Anatomy of a Suicide is really a play, it's really three plays happening simultaneously. Um, and they happen in three different timelines, uh, the 1970s, the 1990s, and a future um, in about 2030. Um, and what happens is that uh, scenes are split across these three timelines, so things happen simultaneously. Um, one of the... <laughs> um, I mean, it's kind of... A, it's an extraordinarily fascinating piece of writing, but it covered... It's... Um, I can't remember, I think it's about uh, 70 different scenes when you add it all up, and it's kind of like all of these different locations. Sorry, it's about 60 different scenes in all of these different locations. And the speed and the fluidity that we had to work at meant that scenically it couldn't be wallpaper and rugs and kind of um, uh, everything else that might relate to the architecture of a room, for example, but that all of the props and furniture would be realistic and would be uh, set in the period that each kind of timeline was happening at but because of the speed just the practicality um, of it meant that we had to create a far more kind of neutral space for everything to kind of work in um, but I mean there in a way I mean there are there are elements of realism in the the holding container as it were for all three timelines across the entire stage as a concrete box, and that is designed to look like concrete, and it is designed uh, to look like it was cast out of slabs, and all of these pieces were really tangible, kind of realistic materials. Um, but the way that we conceived the piece visually was... Um, was much less about the realism of each individual scene and much more about giving, in a Brechtian kind of way actually, it was more about the object and the costume and the relationship between the actor and those props uh, rather than it was their relationship to the overall environment. Can I actually, uh, sorry, uh, the follow up, as I was fascinated by two of the things, the water that Winnie was sitting in and then you were talking about the chocolate and plants. I think everybody looking at these designs, as realistic as they are, is somehow aware that this is um, Seth, if you'll excuse me. Uh, and it's, but within it there are some real things, but the actor in these two cases is experiencing something actual. That actor is sitting in water. Winnie is sitting in water, but the actor is, and we respond to that, water can't act. Uh, cutting out the tongue is not real. It might be horrifying, but it's not real. Eating 24 chocolates is very real. And we, we start to think about the actor going through that, perhaps, rather than the character. So I'm just wondering if you have any, any thoughts about that, where the actor is subjected to something that is real in the external world. Um, without wanting to sound like uh, a pair of sadists, I think that Katie and I do... In, uh, investigate uh, that that reality. Um, the more the more real it is, the more affecting it's likely to be to an audience. 
and um, the uh, in I didn't have a photograph of it, but in the second half of Happy Days, um, obviously uh, Winnie is buried up to her neck, and in this production, the whole it looked as if the whole house had subsided, and she was up to her neck in water, and the the sense of jeopardy that comes with that when you see an actor up to their neck in water, and when they are when you can hear uh, emotion in the actor's voice and the tremble is then creating ripples in the water that is kind of, it's so kind of clearly visible um, that does kind of affect an audience in a way that sometimes it's not so easy to do if things are um, obviously faked or uh, theatrical versions of reality. Do you mind if the audience is, in those instances, reacting to the actor rather than the character? Um, <clears throat> that's a point where I'm not, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where... I, I mean, arguably, you could say that the audience is, respo is hopefully responding to the character, um, given the beautiful performance of... The, but there is a real actor. body there. That is but there important. is a real body there, but I think it's about... Well, it's about the balance of um, suspension of disbelief. How much to have you? How much are you thinking? Oh God, it's awful that you know that Matthew has to eat all of those chocolates as that uh, playing this character on stage, or how much are you believing that Robin, the character, is being forced to eat all of those things? And it'll be a, it's kind of a balance from the audience perception. Move on, uh, Peter. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, a really interesting morning. Um, is I thinking about um, Arnold's description of the island, or the word, environment, <laughs> um, and then Holly talking about um, taking the audience um, from the rehearsal room, the actual nuts and bolts of the rehearsal room, through to something which becomes um, another reality, um, and, and that kind of design that's involved in that. And but then it was, I was fascinated, um, Alex, by um, first the frame, because that distance is us, um, but second, I would say that your, the work you've made, and this is just my perception, is almost site-specific. Mm. I say that in a way, um, because something like, say, say, say Lena Bausch, for example, um, when she did the dance piece with the older people, the dance piece was originally done in a church hall. The church hall was then put on stage. So there's a difference between making a setting and actually bringing a sight to the stage, which I think is probably what you did. Is, is that... Um, That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I completely is that, agree. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, I think so. I think part of the process, part of our process working on these types of shows is, is to... Um, we kind of reverse engineer it. We're trying to re remove the sense of the theatre as much as possible. Um, so, yes, to kind of like reverse it, it's as if we've taken something out of reality, a site-specific space, and kind of literally kind of airdropped it. We use the word airdrop a lot, actually, to kind of like airdrop it into um, the theatre and trying to get that, that relationship as kind of as clean as possible in terms of how they see what that is. I think the way you describe it so beautifully as a slice, almost forensically, mm. as a slice through the theatre. Yeah. So it actually isn't the fourth wall. It's a kind of, um, it's, a, it's a sort of um, medical investigation. It's kind of, it allows us to see something rather than um, giving it to us just like that. But I also think it's interesting what you think about the, the selectivity of it, because actually, what you show us has, is slightly disturbing and familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. It's not, it, because there aren't the distractions that you would have if you were in that actual space. So you're recreating that space, but with this very, as you say, forensic lens, which slightly kind of, not distorts, but what we see is something which is filtered, I think. Yeah, I mean... And heightened. It's yeah. a dream-like quality, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, uh, cleansed, for example, was designed to feel like it was Gracie's dream. So things that happened within the space, flowers growing out of the ground, or kind of like at one moment uh, her teeth literally kind of fall out of her mouth. Um, these things that not we the might actual actor's teeth, not the actual <laughs> actor's teeth, but um, but these things that we might have experienced in a dream world. When we're dreaming, these things feel incredibly real to us. And what we were trying to do is kind of like set ourselves a set of rules on stage where these things might be able to happen. But to all intents and purposes, they, to the characters and to the other people, kind of it, the interactions are really happening. And therefore, if it's set within an environment that we can, that we can recognise, yeah, I feel like you emotionally kind of like connect to some of those mm. actions mm. in that way. So, yes? I was just going to say, um, I think what's interesting is that um, uh, it's really interesting with both of the work, it's what you're talking about, that there's like um, the sense of what the reality is and trying to translate that into something on the stage. Um, and I think that idea of kind of taking a restaurant and plonking it onto the stage it's one thing, but there's a kind of mediation that's going on by the designer in both those cases. And I think that, Alex, when you're putting um, something real on the stage, it's not, I'm presuming it's not that you're just taking a building that exists and putting it on the stage, you're mediating in your design by trying to tell us something about what we, you want us to read from that performance, emphasizing certain areas of it. So although you're taking away that wall, you've created that space. So I, I'm a little familiar with that term from literary theory of the, the idea that the, the, the reader is following the different possible worlds that sort of get narrowed down the farther you read into the book. Um, that there are big constellations, then as, you, as you, the, the author reveals what's happening, you sort of narrow down into what the actual world is of, of, of the, the book. And then, but applying that to theater, um, it's super interesting that um, both the practitioners were talking about sort of a different way of revealing possible worlds through the characters, right? Is that um, there's that degree of separation from what's possible to what we know, um, and then the objects of what, you know, what the sort of separation is. Um, and so I just want to hear a little bit more about how in theater the audience tracks and, and uh, sort of becomes familiar with the rules of a production to find out where the possible worlds lie in, as, as separated from our actual world. I don't know if that makes sense as a question. Can I ask one question? Um, well, um, in, in my um, life at this minute, I'm both create, I call creator, I don't like even the word director, it makes me nervous, but, um, <laughs> What I do know as a visual, as a creator and visual artist in theater, I have about one and a half minutes to get the audience to, to play the rules of the game. So I'm, there's a moment where the creator is totally in charge of that moment and you're saying, and this is the game we're going to play. And if you do it properly, with all courage and all thought, as I think you have done, you've got one and a half minutes, they get it and you're off. But if you don't do it, then they're restless. So I think you have to think about it. It's a very important question. And I think you really have to think about that and have a, a strategy to do that. Well, it's interesting because, of course, the rules of the game are different for every show. Oh, well, yeah. aren't they? Really? Which it would be boring. Yeah. Be boring. yeah. And, of course, with Dante, it was, I'd never done that before, the idea that 
that we'd start the rehearsal room with, mm. you know, modern life around yeah. us, and then we would graduate, and we would really say to the audience, we're trying to imagine this, and we're, you know, so it, it can be, or, or you can come into something that is apparently very, you know, plunges you right back into that moment in history, and there's none of that. So it, it the rule, that, and in a way that's quite exciting, isn't it, that you can decide what the rules are, depending on what the material is, and... Play you just got to get that the audience to be willing to join. Yeah, you. and that is, an, in a way, an abstract thing, but it's a tangible thing, mm. isn't it? Mm. I think if you establish the rules, the audience will follow you anywhere yes. you want to go, mm -hmm. as long as there's some consistency or yeah. that carries it through. Judith, are we? Do we have to finish at one? It, well, we're going to start at two again. So, so we should, we yeah. Um, I think we have to stop there. Can we just um, thank all our speakers and Pamela for a fantastic...